So you got a little bit of time. And you, you reach down for your cell phone, but you reach down and instead you pull out this and you're like, oh, I've got mail. <laughs> From Jesus. <laughs> Love one another. That's good. Okay. So let's now give a big McHenry County Catholic prayer breakfast welcome to Dr. John Berksma. Thank you. It's great to be with you here. Um, and I think we all agree that was a fantastic talk by Kendra. Let's give her a hand. I plan on buying both those books. <laughs> one for my wife and one for myself. And those are fantastic tips uh, for living Catholic uh, family life. It's uh, great to be with you in the Chicago area. I love coming up here. I uh, have some good friends also in the diocese, uh, Monsignor Dan Deutsch, for example. Anybody know Monsignor? A few around, yep, it's been a great stalwart of the uh, diocese. And he did a sabbatical uh, a couple of years ago, actually more than that now, more like 15 years ago now, and uh, went down to Franciscan University and accidentally got put in some of my Bible classes. And uh, then he took a bunch of my material and robbed me blind of it. But anyway. Um, <laughs> He's a great guy, and, and uh, he's had me up to the diocese uh, to do stuff over the years. So it's great to be back, and I love being in the Chicago area. Um, Mac asked me to speak on the Eucharist uh, this morning, which I'm only too happy to do, especially because, as we're all aware, um, our bishops uh, are fostering this three-year uh, Eucharistic focus and celebration culminating uh, next summer in Indianapolis. And so um, Dr. Hahn and I have, have been participating in this, going around the country and doing kind of Eucharistic revivals at uh, different parishes. And of course, the uh, Eucharist is very instrumental in bringing me into the Catholic Church. Now, if 30 years ago you had told me uh, that, um, uh, you know, three decades from then, I'd be standing before 500 Catholics uh, talking about the Eucharist. Uh, first of all, I would have been horrified. <laughs> and secondly, in shock and disbelief. Because I grew up in a tradition that explicitly denied the Eucharist and the Catholic Mass. We, in fact, held that the Eucharist was idolatrous. Yeah, I, I regret having to say that, but, um, and this is why. We reasoned that in the Catholic Mass, bread and wine were worshipped as if they were God, but they were merely creations. And so to worship the creature as if it's the creator, of course, is idolatry. And therefore, we concluded in one of our doctrinal statements, and here I quote directly, the Mass is at bottom nothing other than a denial of the one sacrifice and suffering of Jesus Christ and, forgive me, Lord, a condemnable idolatry. So this is what I had to sign on the line, affirming this uh, statement as well as a lot of other doctrinal statements just to lead worship services in the group that I used to belong to. And so obviously some things have changed. <laughs> And thanks, praise the Lord, absolutely. And I want to talk to you this morning about how that change took place. And I want to begin from when I started in Protestant ministry, because it was actually the praxis of being a Protestant pastor that began to lead me into the Catholic Church. Now you might ask, what kind of Protestant was I? Well, I was a Dutch Calvinist. Anybody here know what a Dutch Calvinist is? A few, very few, all right? Anybody here ever heard of a Presbyterian? Okay, a lot more. So for all those who know what a Presbyterian is, I want you to imagine a Presbyterian with wooden shoes and windmill cookies, okay? <laughs> and there you go, okay? That was my background. And there's a lots, lots of those people over in uh, West Michigan. And... Um, so I actually grew up in a Navy family. My dad was a Navy chaplain representing a Dutch Calvinist group, and I went to West Michigan 
uh, out of high school to, uh, went through our pre-seminary track and um, uh, began to serve as a Protestant pastor uh, in Michigan's uh, second city. And again, as I said, it was actually that practice that began moving me towards the Catholic Church. And if you ask why, I'd say, well, you know, there's, there's five pillars or slogans that are just about all that Protestant theology has in common. Because as you know, there's Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, etc. But what they all have in common is a set of slogans that are called solas in Latin or onlys in English. So how many of you have heard sola scriptura or the Bible alone? Okay, lots of you. All right. How many have heard sola fide or by faith alone? Okay, lots of you, all right? And there's some others as well, sola gratia, etc. But those two, faith alone and scripture alone, are really the bugaboos, or the bugaboosius in Latin. Yeah. Okay, those are the, if you want to be technical about it, those are the, the contentious ones. And when I actually began uh, doing Protestant ministry, I began to find some of the weaknesses of those slogans. And one of the first to go for me was, Sola Fide. And let me tell you a little story about what, what began to give it up for me. So I was a, a young pastor in the downtown area, and I wanted to learn to do evangelism because I had really had no experience in evangelizing in the inner city. So I found an older pastor who actually regularly went door to door uh, sharing the gospel to train and mentor me. And in one of my first experiences doing this, I was following him around in the neighborhood. We knocked on this uh, older woman's door, middle-aged woman, really, and she invited us up to her upstairs apartment. He presented the gospel according to our understanding of it, and surprisingly, she prayed to receive Jesus. She prayed what we call the sinner's prayer to receive Jesus into her heart. Nothing wrong with that. We would call that a spiritual communion, and it should have been followed up with catechesis and the sacraments, etc. But there's nothing wrong with asking Jesus into your heart. That's a good thing. Problem was, after the prayer was over, and we looked up and we're kind of sitting in, on these couches in her upstairs apartment, there's a sense of peace in the room because she's just made a big step forward in her Christian faith. And then my pastoral mentor begins to catechize her. Right? And this is the first thing he says. He says, okay, now that you've prayed to receive Jesus, if you went out tomorrow and robbed a bank and skipped town, would you still go to heaven? And she said, uh, uh, didn't know what was going on. So he, said, and he, so he makes it sharper and he says, yeah. And, and at the following week, you, you shot your neighbor and, uh, and took all his money and ran off. Uh, would you still go to heaven? And she said, no. <laughs> and he said, Yes, you would, because salvation is by faith alone, and once saved, always saved. You can never lose your salvation, and now that you put your faith in Jesus, you can be guaranteed of heaven. And I'm watching this going on. Lady pastor, lady pastor. And when he says that, I think to myself, wait a minute. I agree with the lady. I don't think you can... Pray to receive Jesus and then go shoot people and rob banks and be assured of your salvation. And, but more importantly, it doesn't matter what I thought, okay? What does matter is what the Word of God says. And when he was saying that, all these verses were going through my mind, okay? Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, And likewise, Luke 9, 23, right? If anyone would follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and come after me, right? And and I'm thinking, Jesus didn't tell people, hey, just to pray to receive me and then go do what you want, you know? It's like the costly call of discipleship. So that started me on a journey, brothers and sisters, of about four years of thinking about this whole idea of salvation by faith alone. I read Protestant thinkers, I read the Catholic Catechism and various uh, Catholic theologians on the topic, and I eventually came to the conclusion after about four years that one of two things is true. 
either salvation by faith alone is simply wrong and contrary to the Bible, or by the time you adjust it and nuance it and fix it and qualify it and define it and nuance it some more, you end up backing your way into the Catholic position by the kitchen door. <laughs> and that's still my position today. So salvation by faith alone, that dissipated. And I stopped actually talking about it. And I changed the way I evangelized. And I didn't use what we call the Roman road, which uh, very strongly emphasizes that salvation by faith alone doctrine. And I started using verses out of the Gospel of John to evangelize. But it wasn't just salvation by faith alone that fell for me. It was also sola scriptura, or the Bible alone. And why did that start to dissipate? Well, I began ministry and I had one little uh, corner uh, church in this neighborhood of about 4,000 people. And this neighborhood could, at best, have supported one healthy, flourishing church. But there wasn't just one church in this neighborhood. There was more than six. There was my Dutch Calvinist church. And then about two blocks down, there was another Dutch Calvinist church with slightly different teaching on sexuality and uh, marriage issues, etc. And then a couple blocks down, there was a charismatic storefront church. There was a Hispanic uh, fellowship in the government housing projects. There was a a church up on the hill that called itself the All-American Baptist Church. We never saw anybody going in or out, but they kept the lights on and the sign was fixed up, so something was happening up there. <laughs> and, and more. The Pentecostals out in the suburbs sent in a big red church, uh, bus on uh, Sunday mornings to whisk people away to the suburbs and do what Pentecostals do. And uh, all this was going on. And, you know, what I found out was all of us had strongly different teachings on many things that were not insignificant. So at my church, we taught that you must have your children baptized and as soon as possible. But in the Baptist church, they said, no, that's wrong. It can only be adult baptism. And at my church, we did not speak in tongues. But down at the charismatic storefront, they insisted that you had to speak in tongues. Otherwise, you weren't really a Christian, which made me think, what did that pastor think about me? <laughs> It's kind of second class, halfway Christian. Um, and at first, when I was naive and about 24, I thought, well, my fellow pastors in this neighborhood, they just don't know some verses, you know, that I know, like about infant baptism. You know, they probably haven't reflected on uh, Acts chapter 2, where St. Peter says the promise is for you and for your children. Or in Matthew, where Jesus says, Matthew 19, let the little children come to me. So we know when we would have ecumenical gatherings, we would have you know, an annual gospel fest where we'd close off a street, have chicken and ribs, and a preach off. And uh, I would preach, and the other pastors would preach. And you know, in between times, we'd sit there and you know, eat some potato salad and some chicken and ribs. And, and I'd talk to my fellow pastors, and I thought, well, they just haven't seen these verses. So I'd share some verses with them. And guess what happened? They had their verses too. So they'd quote the end of Mark, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. How can a baby believe? So you have to be baptized as an adult when you can believe, and many others as well. And so it always devolved into verses, verses, verses. Okay? <laughs> and I hope you remember that, because brothers and sisters, outside the Catholic Church in that sola scriptura environment, that's what it always degenerates into. Verses, verses, verses. And there's no, as it were, authority. There's no Supreme Court. There's no person with whom the buck stops to make a decision about whose interpretation of the verses is right. A particularly shocking experience to me was one time I took my congregation to do a congregational fellowship with another congregation in town, and they were an apostolic church. Well, I didn't know very much about the apostolic tradition, uh, so we went bowling together. My parishioners, the other pastor's parishioners, they're all bowling, we're all having a good time. And me and the other pastor, we went to the snack shop and got some of that food that they always serve at bowling alleys, you know, like chips and cheese, right, with the jalapenos, that's like a staple of bowling alley cuisine, right? I get, it's kind of nasty, but anyway. I got one of those because it was the least non-appetizing thing on the menu. 
And so I'm sitting with my fellow pastor, you know, I'm eating the cheds and cheese and stuff like that. So like, hey, you know, so tell me about the apostolic tradition. You know, what, what do you guys believe at your congregation? He says, well, we're, G- we're Jesus only Christians. And I said, oh, that sounds interesting. What's, uh, what's Jesus only mean? He says, well, we, we baptize in the name of Jesus alone. I thought, huh, well, most of the rest of us do it in the Father, Son, and Spirit. He's like, yeah, well, we think that's, that Jesus is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. <coughs> Can't get out of my chest. Like, oh, what was that? It's like, yeah, we, we think that Jesus is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Interesting. Uh, how do you get that? Well, you know, some, ver- some verses of Acts, or in fact, most verses of Acts say that they baptized in the name of Jesus, but at the Great Commission in Matthew 28, it says, baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. So, Bible can't contradict, it- contradict itself, so therefore, Jesus must be the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Interesting. I said, well... What about in John, where Jesus says, the Father is greater than I? And he says, well, that means Jesus' mode of existence as the Father is greater than his mode of existence as the Son. And I'm thinking about, oh, modalism! (laughs) I knew what that was, because I was in seminary. Okay? This guy isn't even a Trinitarian. Does not believe in the Trinity. But he believes fully in the inspiration of Scripture, even the inerrancy of scripture. And I went home, and I couldn't quote any verse, because any verse that I mentioned to him, it's always, well, it's this mode of existence, you know? You really can't disprove it. And I went away, went home for that event, shocked, realizing that, gosh, holding the scriptures in high esteem is still not enough even to make you a Christian. Because if you don't believe in the Trinity... You're not a Christian. It's a different religion. Okay, so sola scriptura fell by the wayside for me. And so, uh, brothers and sisters, after about four years of doing Protestant ministry, it was about time for me to get what we called fully ordained. Okay, it was about time. I, I had been in the seminary during this time. I had a license to conduct religious services, but had not received full ordination, as we call it. I was what we call licensed, which is a little bit like a transitional deacon. And, uh, and so my ordination was coming up. And at that point, I began to get cold feet because I was having these concerns about our theology. Um, without realizing it, I was beginning to doubt these pillars of Protestantism. I wouldn't have phrased it like that at the time, but I was really losing faith in these basic principles. And so with my ordination approaching, I didn't know if I wanted to commit my life to this group that we were, that we were in, that my wife and I were in and were raising our children in. And, uh, and so I began to get depressed because I had been preparing for this for about 11 years, you know, 11 years of undergraduate and graduate work and to finally come to the threshold and not know if you want to go over and do this, that's kind of depressing with all that education down the tubes, if it was down the tubes. And then I also felt disillusioned because, Lord, where are you in all this? I thought I was following your will at every step. So, Lord, why have you brought me here now to this state of confusion? And then it also left me directionless because what do I do with myself? I mean, for heaven's sakes, brothers and sisters, my undergraduate degree was in Greek and Latin. Okay. (laughs) That qualifies you for a job in food service, okay? You deserve a break today and all of that. So what was I going to do with myself if I didn't go forward? The only reason to have that degree was to read the Bible in the original languages in preparation for preaching. So I found myself at the age of about 30, depressed, disillusioned, and directionless. And at that point, I did something rash that many depressed, disillusioned, and directionless people do. I applied to graduate school. (laughs) It's true. Not proud of it now. 
thinking like a good American, all I need is more education, right? That's the answer to everything. So I thought, well, I'll go back and get another degree, and maybe that will allow me to sort my head out and uh, figure out what I should do with myself. And so I sent away all these applications to different graduate schools, and who should get back with the biggest, best offer but the University of Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana? Just about two hours south of where I was serving up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and they whined me and dined me and treated me like a football recruit. And, um, and how could I say no? And so, and, and to make it so good, they had Protestants teaching on the theology faculty. So I thought, this is great. I can go down, study with Protestants, get paid by Catholic. It's like robbing the Egyptians, you know? <laughs> Maybe I'll convert some Catholics and get some notches on my belt on the, in the whole process. Because as confused as I was, I still was... You know, the Catholic Church was not on my radar screen. It wasn't on my map. I had no intention of becoming Catholic. Uh, for all my doubts about Protestant theology, I still felt that the Catholic Church was a false church. And so I moved my family down onto the campus of the University of Notre Dame. And to my surprise, one of the first men that I met at Notre Dame had three qualities I never thought I would find in the same person. He was highly intelligent, full of the Holy Spirit, and Catholic. <laughs> and I didn't understand how you could get those three qualities in the same person without creating some kind of explosion or antimatter reaction, you know? How can you be smart and full of the Holy Spirit and Catholic? Because I figured if you were smart and full of the Holy Spirit, you would realize that the Catholic Church was false and you would get yourself out of there. You know, now I had known some smart Catholics, but they tended to be cynical types who only went to Mass for the sake of their uh, mom. And I had known some Holy Spirit-filled Catholics because I had encountered the Catholic Charismatic Renewal. But with those people, I wasn't sure that their elevator went to the top floor, okay? <laughs> and when I ran into them, I was like, well, Jesus is going to be nice to you at the final judgment because you just don't know anything, okay? And... Um, but like a smart, Holy Spirit-filled Catholic, uh, this, was, this was craziness to me. Uh, and, and you see what's going on was, he was an inexplicable Catholic, right? Because I had my pigeonholes for Catholics. I had uh, the indifferent Catholic, and I had the ignorant Catholic. And every time I met a Catholic, I'm like, okay, which pigeonhole does he go into? How do I explain away his Catholicism? Oh, this, ca this, this guy is Catholic because he's indifferent. Okay? He just doesn't care. Or this person's Catholic because they're ignorant. You know, they just don't know any better. But here, I didn't have a pigeonhole for this guy. He was an inexplicable Catholic. You know what? And uh, this guy, Michael, okay, I want to be like him when I grow up. <laughs> okay? I'm still striving to be like him, even though he's actually three years younger, but please don't mention that. <laughs> but uh, I still want to be an inexplicable Catholic. Anybody else here want to be an inexplicable Catholic? You know... Amen. Let's give it up. Let's give it up for that. If you remember something from this talk, being an inexplicable Catholic, you know, I think that's what we all want to do here at the McHenry County Catholic Prayer Breakfast is go change a little bit so that when people see us, they're like, wow, that Catholic doesn't fit our stereotypes. That Catholic doesn't fit into our categories. I have to find out what's going on. And that was the case with Michael. I felt like Moses in the burning bush. It was like, I got to step aside and see this site, you know. I got to figure out why he doesn't self-combust, okay? What, what's going on here? And so I got, I got together with Michael. I said, Michael, you know, you really fascinate me. You know, you're super smart and can really see that you love the Lord, but I really don't understand why you stay in the Catholic Church. Can we get together and talk theology? And Michael said, sure, that's fine. So we, we set up to get together and talk theology. We met at the, uh, the huddle which was uh, the name for the food court there at the University of Notre Dame. Of course, uh, most things at the University of Notre Dame are named after football, which is one of the religions practiced there, but <laughs> <coughs> be that as it may. Uh, so we met at the, uh, at the huddle, and uh, you know we would get our two Whopper Juniors from Burger King's, a deal they had, two for two kind of thing, and we'd sit there and, uh, and we'd talk theology. And when we would get together, I would run against Michael 
all of my typical anti-Catholic polemics that I found so effective with fallen away, non-practicing Catholics that I met in the neighborhood where I did ministry up in the inner city in Michigan. And when I would run those anti-Catholic polemics, Michael would respond in a way that was very unfair. <laughs> he would respond with scripture. And the first time he did that, I thought, wait, that's against the rules. I don't know who wrote the rules, but that's against them, okay? Let's remind ourselves, me Protestant, you Catholic, okay? I quote scripture, you quote the popes or something, okay? <laughs> but Catholics aren't allowed to quote scripture to support Catholic belief. But not only would he quote scripture to support belief, he carried around a Bible with him. In fact, the, uh, the same edition that uh, I carry to this day. I learned to carry a Bible with me from a Catholic. Can you believe this? Bible toting Catholics, what's the world coming to? Are pigs flying? Is hell frozen over? Okay. But he would carry one in his backpack or sometimes in his pocket. And this little Bible was set up for daily reading. And he did daily devotional reading out of this little New Testament. Uh, what I so like about this, uh, this edition is it's about the size of a cell phone. And, you know, so you can keep it in your pocket, you know. And then when you're in those situations where you, you know, you got a little time and you're tempted to uh, reach for your phone to check your email or something like that, when you're, like, you're at the supermarket and you're in the 12-item line and the lady in front of you has got 22 items and a bunch of coupons, you're like, oh, no, you know. So you got a little bit of time. And you, you reach down for your cell phone, but you reach down and instead you pull out this and you're like, oh, I've got mail <laughs> from Jesus. <laughs> love one another. That's good. Okay. So I love this. And I, I, I keep it, I usually keep it in my breast pocket and in a suit coat, you know. And uh, you know what we call this in Ohio? Concealed carry. <laughs> Is it legal in Illinois? <laughs> oh, no. Anyway, I got a bunch of these. Maybe you want to pick one of these up for my uh, book table later. But uh, I really believe in Catholics who tote the Bible. And it's not just me, but it's Pope Francis has urged us about 13 times by my count in different uh, addresses to carry the scriptures with us. Because, you know, a, a Bible toting Catholic is an armed Catholic for spiritual warfare. And spoiler alert, I was brought into the church by a Catholic who knew his scriptures and kept the scriptures with him. So I think scripture knowing, scripture carrying Catholics are dangerous, okay? Dangerous to the evil one. And I really try to promote that in keeping with the Holy Father. So again, I would, um, you know, uh, uh, quote these scriptures against Michael and against the Catholic Church, and he would respond by scripture. And then one particular instance really sticks in my mind. One day he turned the tables on me. I was challenging about some aspect of Catholic teaching or culture that I didn't believe was found in the Bible. And he said, well, John, why do you think that everything about the Christian faith has to be found explicitly in the Bible? And I said, well, you know, the Bible is the basis of, of all our faith and uh, everything that we believe should be out of the scriptures. And he said, well, where does it say that in the Bible? And I thought for a moment, and I went immediately to the first place that most Protestants go to defend sola scriptura. And I said, well, what about uh, 2 Timothy 3.16? All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. He's like, yeah, it says it's useful, but it doesn't say it's sufficient for everything that you need to do. Do you have another verse? And I thought for a moment, and I didn't. Okay, 2 Timothy 3.16, that's where we always went, but you look at it carefully, it doesn't say sola scriptura, it doesn't say it's all you need, it says the scriptures are important, that they're useful, and that you need them to be complete, but doesn't say that it's all you need. And then Michael pressed hard on me, he said, actually John, he said, do you know that there are scriptures that insist that we need tradition? And I said, no, they're not. And he said, yes, there is. 
And he said, 2 Thessalonians 2.15, have you read it recently? I'm like, well, I'm sure I've read it sometime, and I'm sure it doesn't say that. So he pulls out his Bible, and he reads from 2 Thessalonians 2.15. And, it, and that, that's where Paul is exhorting the Thessalonians, stand fast, my brothers, and hold to the traditions that were passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. And Michael said, look, that's a pleasing illustration of the two ways that God's word comes to us. By letter, Paul is referring to things like Ephesians, Philippians, etc. that became the scripture. And by word of mouth, he's referring to what we call tradition, capital T tradition, the, the oral teaching of the apostles handed down. And I said, let me look at that. I grabbed his Bible and I looked at that and sure enough, there it said, hold fast to the traditions that you were taught by us, whether by word of mouth or by letter. And I thought to myself, why have I not ever seen this? So I gave it back to him and I went home later that day and I got out my Bible, which was a new international version, which is a very popular translation among evangelical Protestants in the U.S. and one that I had grown up on. So I I paged in my Bible to 2 Thessalonians 2.15, to look at the verse, and there it says, hold fast to the teachings that were handed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. And I thought, huh, teachings? I wonder what it really is. But I had that Greek major, so I had my Greek Bible, so I could go to the original language. And there in the Greek, it was clearly tradition. Hold on to the tradition, parodesis, okay, which is the Greek word for for tradition. And I thought, why have I not been seeing this? So I got out my electronic Bible, started doing a word search, searched for all the, uh, the instances of the Greek word tradition in the New Testament, found that three times in the New Testament, St. Paul commends the early Christians for holding fast to tradition. But in all three times, my Protestant translation of the Bible It translated the word parodesis as teaching and not as tradition. But all the times that Jesus refers to tradition negatively, like when he criticizes the traditions of the Pharisees, my translation translated traditions. (laughs) So you see what happens when you're raised on that kind of translation? You think that there's no positive role for tradition in the Christian life, due again to a mistranslation. Well, that kind of rocked my boat quite significantly. And I began to open up more and more to what Michael was telling me. And after several months of sharing back and forth, I grew to respect Michael's position and see that he could defend the Catholic faith from Scripture. He had an impressive set of Catholic verses. However, I still had a bunch of, so to speak, Calvinist verses that I didn't feel were fully refuted. And so at that point in our relationship, I felt like it's just back to what it was before with my Protestant pastor friends up in Michigan, you know, verses, verses, verses. He's got his, I've got mine. And at that point, Michael acknowledged, he said, you know, I think we've reached a kind of stalemate if we're just going to be arguing from scripture alone. And I agree with him. I said, yeah, pretty much does seem that way. And so Michael said, why don't we go to the earliest of the church fathers, the guys that knew the apostles themselves, and read their writings and allow them, so to speak, to cast the deciding vote between our two positions. And I thought, well, that sounds good, but I don't think we got any writings from anybody who knew the apostles. And Michael said, oh, yes, we do. Have you ever heard the, the Apostolic Fathers? And I said, the Apostolic who? And he said, the Apostolic Fathers? Like, no, never heard of them. Clement of Rome, Ignatius of Antioch? Nope, never heard of them. I said, well, let's, let's get their writings and start reading. And I'm like, yeah, let's do it. And I thought, this is going to prove my point. You know, I'm going to read Clement of Rome, going to read Ignatius of Antioch. For sure, they're Calvinists, and they're going to cast the vote. In, uh, in my favor. And so we went and we got, um, I got an edition uh, in, in a couple different forms, uh, more than one edition 
of uh, what we call the apostolic fathers. Now, again, we call them apostolic because they knew the apostles personally. They were trained by the apostles. These are very, very early fathers. Clement of Rome, for example, was one of the three uh, successors of Peter that were trained by Peter himself. Clement was the last of them that had known Peter personally to serve as Peter's successor. He served as pope around the year 80, uh, so very early on before even all of the books of the New Testament had been written. And uh, another, Ignatius of Antioch, who was bishop of the church of Antioch in uh, Syria, who was a disciple of the apostle John. And Ignatius of Antioch wrote uh, seven letters to the churches of Asia Minor around the year 106 AD. That's only 10 years after the Apostle John had passed on to heavenly glory. So just a decade after the death of the last apostle, St. Ignatius of Antioch wrote seven precious letters while he was being taken captive by the Romans through Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, to the west coast of Asia Minor where they took him by ship to Italy where he was fed to lions in the Colosseum and martyred that way. And he knew he was going to his martyrdom, and as he was being uh, carted in a, like, a, like a wagon uh, through Asia Minor, all chained up, when they would stop for the night, he would dash off a letter to the local congregation in whatever city he found himself. And uh, his uh, remaining letters are are, are treasures of the Catholic faith. And if you've never read them before, I highly recommend uh, that you read them for spiritual reading. They would make great reading for Advent uh, coming up, speaking of you know, liturgical seasons. And so I got into reading these, these fathers, uh, brothers and sisters, and I read Clement of Rome first, read his whole letter, and it was almost all about apostolic succession, which seemed vaguely Catholic to me. So this is not working. So I went to Ignatius of Antioch. I thought, maybe this guy, Ignatius of Antioch, will, will make my case for, for me. So I get into reading his letters. And as I'm reading his letters, I'm getting more and more nervous because he's saying things like, only that Eucharist is valid, which is approved by your bishop. And I'm like, ouch, because we didn't have either bishops or the Eucharist, but clearly both were present at this early, pristine uh, uh, stage of the young church's growth and development where the teaching of the apostles was still ringing in people's ears, so to speak. And I read on further, and he said another thing, uh, where the bishop is, there is the Catholic church. Hurt me. <laughs> okay. There again, we didn't have bishops, and I thought the term Catholic was not invented until like the 1200s. And here, like the earliest possible uh, time period of the church, they're already using the term Catholic to distinguish the true church from various heresies. But this is the kickers, brothers and sisters. I got to his letter to the town of Smyrna. And it's, you know, modern editions divided into chapters. And at, at, I'm reading through, and about in chapter 6 of St. Ignatius of Antioch, his letter to the Smyrnaeans, chapter 6, he's warning the Christians of Smyrna against the heretics, against people with false teaching. And he gives several indications of who is a heretic. And one of the signs of a heretic is that they refuse to confess the Eucharist to be the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ, which suffered for our sins and which the Father in his goodness raised for our salvation. I read that and I read it again. They refuse to confess the Eucharist to be the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ, which suffered for our sins and which the Father, in his goodness, raised for our salvation. Amen. Amen. Give it up. And notice it says which, not who. It's not saying the Eucharist is Jesus who suffered and who was raised. It's saying the Eucharist is the flesh that suffered and was raised. And remember that Greek major? <laughs> so I go back to the Greek. I found an edition in Greek and looked at it. And sure enough, what we call the relative pronoun, the which, is feminine in Greek. 
because sarx, the Greek word for flesh, is a feminine noun. So that which and which is referring back not to Jesus, but to Jesus' flesh. So what I'm trying to tell you is it's so tangible. His statement is so graphic. It's the flesh that suffered, that was beaten, that was flogged, that was crucified, and the flesh that was raised again. And you're a heretic if you don't confess that it is. And I read it a third time. And I thought, oh no. There's no way to get a symbolic interpretation out of what he just said. In fact, he's ruling out symbolic interpretations. And I thought to myself, well, he knew the Apostle John. It's only been 10 years since the Apostle John died. That's not enough time for him to get confused. Where is he getting this? So I go back into the New Testament. I read all the passages in the New Testament about the Eucharist, and it dawns on me as if for the first time, gosh, the plain sense of all these passages simply is that it's Jesus' body. Like John 6, unless you eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of Man, you have no life in you. And I'm thinking to myself, what do I think these mean? How ironic is this? I'm arguing with this Catholic. I'm the Protestant. I'm supposed to be all about the plain, literal sense of Scripture to get around the popish hermeneutics that evade the real meaning. And now the shoe's on the other foot. My Catholic friend's defending the literal sense of Scripture, and I'm trying to evade the literal sense. I can't refuse to join the Catholic Church because they take the Bible too seriously. (laughs) That's not a good reason not to become Catholic. I can see how that's going to go over at the final judgment. I'm going to stand before Jesus like, why didn't you join the Catholic Church? Well, Lord, um, they take the Bible too seriously. (laughs) I just didn't see that going over very well. So I began to think to myself, and I had a sinking feeling in my stomach. Oh, no. I might have to become Catholic. (laughs) And then I had a mental image. The Pope was walking towards me. It was John Paul II at the time, but he was dressed like Darth Vader. (laughs) It's like... John, I am your father. (laughs) This is so painful. Oh, my conversion was so painful. The Catholic Church is the only religious organization I know where people come in unwillingly, (laughs) kicking and screaming, like, I really don't want to do this, but I just feel like I have to. (laughs) I have to become Catholic. And so... um, About 36 hours after reading St. Ignatius of Antioch, um, I knew I had to become Catholic. I began the process of coming into the church. Took about 18 months, um, had to talk to my wife, had to work out things about Mary and about the Pope and so on. But February 24th, 2001, I came into the church and for the first time on a Saturday vigil, received the Lord in the most blessed sacrament. Amen. All right. You're probably a Protestant convert. <laughs> 100 percent Catholic. Oh, amen. Woohoo! Cradle Catholics are awesome. A cradle Catholic converted me. He became my sponsor. So that guy, Michael, that I was telling you about, he was my sponsor on February 24, 2001. Bishop Jenke, lately of Diocese of Peoria, uh, was actually the auxiliary of Fort Wayne South Bend at the time. He confirmed me and uh, brought me into the church. So I just want to leave you with two things, uh, brothers and sisters, today. Um, First of all, I know that we're suffering through a difficult time in the church's history and that there's a lot of confusion, especially a lot of doctrinal confusion out there, and it can shake our faith. I know sometimes it does for me, and I have to go to my spiritual director and and sort things out. But uh, let me remind you, uh, we have confusion within the church, but outside the church, it is chaos. Okay? It is absolute chaos. You're based on the scripture alone, and nobody can agree how to interpret the scripture. So as much as we have our difficulties and our disagreements, I have been where it's much worse. Okay? I feel like uh, you know somebody that was out splashing around in the flood, crying out to the ark, you know, and Noah went down and hooked me and 
pull me back onto the ark, you know? And I get onto the ark, and everybody's complaining about how stinky it is on the ark. <laughs> and I feel like saying, yeah, but you know what? It's not very good in the water, <laughs> okay? So please remember that. As stinky as it gets in the ark, it's a lot better to be in the ark than out in the water. Amen? Amen. So let's keep our faith. And the other thing I want to leave you with is, you know, our faith is not based on quarrels about disciplinary matters and different approaches to ministry and different emphases and uh, the political expression of uh, how Catholics should be involved in you know, the government, etc. Our faith is based on Jesus in the most holy sacrament. Amen? Amen? And so when I get up in the morning and when I feel discouraged, I like to remind myself, as long as there is one valid ordained priest in the world celebrating the Eucharist and making Jesus present for me, I am Catholic. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. As long as we have access to the Eucharist, let's go to the Lord in prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for not leaving us orphans but leaving us the full presence of your Son to abide with us forever until he should return in glory. Help us always to cultivate that faith and cultivate Eucharistic joy and share it with our separated brothers and sisters. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to thank the uh, organizers of McHenry uh, County Catholic Prayer Breakfast for inviting me and they also uh, have permitted me to make a short appeal for an organization that together with uh, Dr. Scott Hahn, I lead, and that is the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. Uh, when you came in, you may have seen a table with a lot of folders like these. These are folders from the uh, St. Paul Center. Uh, we are a biblical apostolate based out of Steubenville. And I'd like to just ask, a, uh, give you a brief scenario, okay? Let's imagine somebody moves into McHenry County, and they're already a Christian, but you know, they're looking to go deeper in their faith, and they think, well, maybe I want to uh, uh, join a Bible study. And so they begin asking around in their workplace from other people that they find out are Christians that they work, for, work with, and uh, say, hey, you know, uh, I just moved into the county. Uh, is there someplace in town you know, where there's a really good Bible study that I could join. And wouldn't it be great if their coworkers came back and said, you know, I hear that the best Bible study around is at St. Elizabeth Ann Seton in Crystal Lake, you know, or St. Joe's, or another Catholic parish. Wouldn't it be cool, how many would like to see the best Bible studies in town are actually at Catholic parishes? Who would like to see that realized? Okay, fantastic, all right. If you, if you share that vision, Please pick up one of these, and if you open it up, you'll see some information about the St. Paul Center and the different apostolates that we do. Uh, we started about 20 years ago with the vision of creating the best, Catholic, best Bible studies in town at Catholic parishes. We got into that, and we realized that if we're going to do that, we needed the support of priests as well. And so we became two-pronged in our approach, Catholic uh, biblical literacy for laity, and fluency for clergy. And so we began priest conferences. We now run three priest conferences around the country, one in Napa, one in Austin, Texas, and one in Wheeling, West Virginia at different times of the year. Last year we had over 600 priests attend our conferences where I taught on scripture, Dr. Scott Hahn taught, many other fabulous theologians from around the country uh, really inspired and, and gave these priests three days of, uh, of rejuvenation. And they went back empowered, and you know, each priest, they say, reaches 10,000 Catholics or more. So the multiplier effect is, is uh, really incredible. And so, uh, again, I encourage you to pick up these folders, take a look at the good things that we're doing, and consider signing up for more information or uh, becoming one of our partners uh, to support the apostolate that we're doing. If you become a gold member, uh, that uh, opens up to you all of the resources of our website, which is kind of a Netflix of Catholic biblical teaching. So the best uh, biblical teaching on the web. I've got a couple of courses on the Gospels and Psalms, Dr. Scott Hahn on St. Paul, 
uh, Father uh, Boniface of uh, Latrobe on prayer. So many wonderful stuff on that streaming platform. So check that out. And if you fill out this card, even if you don't feel ready yet to become a supporting member, if you just feel, fill out the card and drop it off at my book table, which is to the right uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the hall here, uh, we will put you in a raffle for free books. <laughs> so how cool is that? Yeah, when I get back to Steubenville, we'll send packages of uh, free books to the raffle winners for all those who fill out a card. So please consider doing that. Um, the rest of my story of uh, my journey to the Catholic Church, if it interests you, is in this book called Stunned by Scripture. I have some of those uh, with me today. And, uh, and don't forget, consider picking up a concealed carry weapon before you leave today. Thank you so much.